The robust, fleet-footed predatory theropod dinosaurs, known as the Tyrannosaurs, dominated North America and Asia during the late Cretaceous. Anywhere they are found, they are the only group of giant predatory theropod, having seemingly pushed out any other large theropods or simply took advantage of their decline. As of now, their general evolutionary trends from the late Jurassic to the end Cretaceous mass extinction are relatively well known. But it's all the weird twists and turns they took during all that which is a mystery. Mexico is part of North America, as much as it seems some people want to segregate it from the rest of the continent, and as such, it shares all of the dinosaur groups that populated the rest of the continent during the late Cretaceous. Speaking of the late Cretaceous, the Cretaceous period itself is the longest period of time during the Phanerozoic Eon, which is the span of time in which life has existed on Earth 538 million years ago to present. Since the Cretaceous period is so long, it's actually quite helpful to chop it up into sections and to then zero in on whatever was going on in those sections, rather than to refer to the whole period of time. Sure, the further back in time you go, the worse the fossil record tends to get, but there are plenty of blank spaces throughout every span of time. As a great example, not a ton is known about the various chunks of the Cretaceous period in Mexico. This is mostly due to economics. There aren't as many paleontologists or paleontology students as there are in the US, Canada, or Europe. Fewer eyes scouring outcrops for fossils means fewer finds. It doesn't help that most finds that have been made are mostly fragmentary. Interestingly, it's the hadrosaurs that preserve the best so far. Considering the latest discovery of Tyrannosaurus micraensis so close to Mexico, you wouldn't be crazy in wondering why there seemed to be no Tyrannosaurs in actual Mexico. In fact, no Tyrannosauroids have ever been found in Mexico except for one Tyrannosaurid, La Bocania anomala, named from such fragmentary material that its identity has been something of a working hypothesis for the last half century. A biologist might suspect that predatory theropod dinosaurs had large territorial ranges. This is the case for many predatory animals with us today, and it does seem to be the case for the predatory theropod dinosaurs known from large samples of specimens. Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, Despletosaurus, and Tyrannosaurus, all examples of the later Tyrannosaurids, are known from relatively large swaths of land. Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, and Despletosaurus are known from many outcrops in Canada, with Despletosaurus also popping up in Montana. Tyrannosaurus is known from Canada to New Mexico. Despite this, there also seems to be quite a lot of endemism, depending on who you talk to, of course. Endemism is when animal populations are somewhat isolated to a region and begin to evolve away from an original population. They become endemic to the region. This seems to have occurred a few times in various dinosaur groups during the late Cretaceous epoch in North America, specifically along the Rocky Mountains, starting in Alaska and all the way down past the Rocky Mountains to the tip of Mexico. This is because North America was politely parted through its middle by a shallow sea called the Western Interior Seaway. This bugger lasted around 34 million years, from the beginning of the late Cretaceous around 100 million years ago to the beginning of the Paleocene Epoch around 66 million years ago. The exact extent of this seaway towards the very end of the Cretaceous is not known for certain, but there is plenty of evidence to suggest that at least a portion of it was around to greet the space rock. Anyways, the separation of North America into the western continent of Laramidia and the eastern continent of Appalachia generally isolated dinosaurs. Laramidia seemed to have experienced further geographic barriers many times throughout the late Cretaceous, as the inland sea transgressed and regressed into and away from the continent. As the sea did this, it cut off easy pathways for land animals to migrate along Laramidia. It was this isolation that forced animals to evolve into different groups over time. 
recent work by Denver Fowler, Elias Warshaw, Daniela Barrera Guevara, and many more have posited that some dinosaur groups experienced periods of endemism punctuated by periods of migration up and down Laramidia, resulting in new genera and species that would mingle and compete before being separated again. This case was made using Ceratopsian dinosaurs as the example. Other work along these lines was done with the many species of Despletosaurus, showing that the most likely hypothesis seemed to be that each known species of Despletosaurus evolved into one another over time and in semi-isolation in northern Laramidia, what is now Montana and Alberta. If you take your attention to the south, you'll see that the same thing was going on. Teratophonius is currently known from Utah, with a potential specimen from Montana awaiting purchase or publication. Bistaiverser is known only from New Mexico. And then, of course, there was the much later Tyrannosaurus macriensis, also of New Mexico. The most southern known Tyrannosaurid, and the only one from Mexico proper, is Labocania anomala. Labocania was discovered in 1970 by famed Californian paleontologist Harley Garboni on a joint expedition to Baja, California between the LA County Museum and the National Geographic Society. Its remains were very fragmentary, consisting of a bit of upper jaw, a bit of lower jaw, a chunk from the back and top of the skull, and a small chunk from the back and bottom of the skull, plus three bits of pelvis, a single tail rib or chevron, a bone from the foot, and a single toe bone. Enough was recovered to confidently identify the animal as a theropod dinosaur, but its descriptor, Ralph Molnar, couldn't confidently place it in any known group. Despite this, he made a few comparisons. It shares traits with Tyrannosaurids, Allosauroids, and whatever the hell kind of theropod Bahariasaurus was. Over the half century since Labacania was discovered, a few scientists have tried to narrow in on a better identification. Thomas Holtz compared it to abelosauroids and tyrannosauroids, opting more for a tyrannosauroid identification. Tyrannosaur is the one which has stuck, since there seem to be more tyrannosaur traits in Labocania than allosauroid traits. In a similar fashion to how there is known material of Teratophonius in Utah, with the potential for some north of it, there is Labocania in Baja California, and now, the potential for another one to the southeast of it. All the way back in 2000, a jumbled skeleton of a large theropod dinosaur was discovered by paleontologist Martha C. Aguilon in sediments belonging to the Cerro del Pueblo formation 54 kilometers west of Saltillo, Coahuila, Mexico. Once these fossils were field prepared, jacketed, and returned to a museum, in this case, the Museo del Desierto in Saltillo, fossil preparators went to work with pneumatic hand tools, dental picks, and pin vices to remove as much of the rocky matrix as they could. Once the specimen was fully prepared, all of the bones could be fully accounted for. The dinosaur, specimen CPC-2974, consists of a chunk of the upper jaw, a bone called the maxilla plus some parts of the top of the cranium, both halves of the toppest middlest part called the frontals. Then there is the bottom and underside part of the bone that makes up the brow, it's called the lacrimal. From here there are parts of the nasal bones, the back end of the back of the skull, a bone called the squamosal, bits from a neck vertebra, some back vertebrae from the end of the back, the end of two tail vertebrae, and a tail vertebra neural arch. Both ends of the left humerus, bits of the hips, three chunks of the left femur, both ends of the left tibia, one end of the left fibula, as well as a foot bone and some toesies. There are also apparently some other specimens that were referred to this species based on some shared similarities. A fragment of a lower jaw and some teeth. All in all, not a great specimen, but it could be way worse. Unfortunately, it seems as though this specimen languished within the collections of the Museo del Desierto for 20 years without description, though it may have been referenced in a paper here or there. All of this changed in 2024 when paleontologist Hector Rivera Silva and Nick Longridge published their description of this specimen. The researchers measured all of the bones and quantified all of its traits, some of which were autopomorphies or traits unique to a taxon and not seen in any of its cousins or ancestors. This proved to the authors that this theropod was both a tyrannosaurid and a unique animal that needed a new name. 
based on the time and place of the rocks from which the specimen was extracted, plus all of its traits. The team found it to be too close to the only other known Mexican Tyrannosaur to be a unique genus. Therefore, they named this animal Labocania aguilone, with the new species name in honor of the scientist who found it. Before we get into the nitty gritty of what the heck was going on with Labocania aguilone, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to see how big this new species was. The authors found some of their own estimates, but got in contact with Omar Lagarda Gonzalez, also known as the Dark Nix, and Ruben Molina to help come up with better estimations, since that's their specialty. Based on the lengths of its skull and femur bones, the Dark Nix estimates La Bacania Agione to have been around 6.3 meters, 20 feet in length, and 1 ton. That's around the same size as Labacania anomala, which has been estimated at 6 to 8.2 meters, 20 to 27 feet, 1.5 to 2.6 tons. Too bad these critters aren't complete enough to have a perfect idea of how they differed visually to an onlooker, rather than minute bony differences. Thanks, Mr. Man. With all of its traits quantified in phylogenetic software, the authors found that Labocania agione, and by extension Labocania anomala, placed most closely to Bastaiverser and an as yet unnamed tyrannosaur from the Aguja formation. The new traits preserved in Labocania agione that were not found in Labocania anomala provide more evidence for the tyrannosaur identification of both of these species. Since these sorts of identifications are always working hypotheses, this is up to further interpretations and discoveries, but for now it seems Labocania is much more firmly tyrannosaur than ever before. Okay, so this critter is actually way weirder than the authors pointed out. You see, the fossils come from the Cerro del Pueblo formation, which is a unit of rock that outcrops in many places in Coahuila, Mexico. It has been dated to 73.63 to 72.74 million years ago, thanks to the fossil remains of ammonites that provide a biochronologic bracket for the rocks. These dates are part of the Campanian Age of the Late Cretaceous Epoch. This isn't particularly weird out of context, because this is around the same time that Tyrannosaurids start popping up across Laramidia, the aforementioned Bistaiverser and Teratophonius, as well as Dynamoterror. The weirdest thing is when you take the first Labacania anomala into account. You see, the Labacania anomala fossils belong to the Labacana Roja formation. This unit of rock was originally thought to date to the late Campanian age of the late Cretaceous, around 73 million years ago. This would make sense and place both species of this genus into close proximity in time. However, work done in 2022 reanalyzed the rocks of this formation using zircon dating methods and found them to be way older. This new research found the La Bocana Roja formation to be 93.6 million years old, the Cenomanian to Turonian stages of the late Cretaceous. Now, this might not seem that strange from the onset, but dinosaur species tend to last only a few million years before evolving or dying out. Genera last longer, with a wide span of 5 to as much as 30 million years. But this has not yet been seen in the Tyrannosaurs. Of course, that doesn't mean it didn't happen, but only that there is yet no evidence for this due to a low sample size. Assuming the times are accurate for both of these rock units and the Labacania remains found within, that means the Labacania genus lasted for around 20 million years. That's well within that 5 to 30 million year genus lifespan and would be the first definitive instance of a Tyrannosaur genus lasting this long. Now, this could say something interesting about biogeography for these animals during the late Cretaceous. You see, the Gulf of California only opened up during the middle of the Cenozoic era, many tens of millions of years after Labacania were done and gone. When Labacania was alive, there were mountains up the middle of Laramidia, dividing the east and west coasts. It seems that Labocania anomala was on the west coast and Labocania agione was on the east coast. This could account for the time difference and help to validate the separation of these two specimens as separate species. Not much is known of the animals that were along the west coast of Laramidia during the Cretaceous. This could just be fossil record or collector bias, and the reality was that there were all sorts of weird dinosaurs evolving all along that coast in relative isolation to all the dinosaurs that there is good record for along the east coast. 
or the seeming lack of West Coast dinosaurs could reflect a real geographical or geological barrier. After all, there was a good bit of geologic activity occurring along the West Coast throughout the Mesozoic era. Though it started slowing down by the Cretaceous, reaching a more stable zone in the early Cenozoic before the aforementioned San Andreas Fault and its other faulty friends shifting a chunk of the West Coast upwards as a result of the East Pacific Rise, fighting a losing battle with the North American Plate. Another weird thing about the 93.6 million year age of Labacania anomala, a seemingly more advanced tyrannosaurid, is that it was alive at the same time as many other more basal tyrannosauroids. The Mongolian Electrosaurus at 96 to 85 million years ago, Chinese Jinbeisaurus at 99 to 71 million years ago, Utah and Moros at 96.4 million years ago, New Mexican Susky Tyrannus at 93.9 to 89.8 million years ago, and Uzbek Timurlengia at 92 to 90 million years ago. These basal forms of Tyrannosauroid could just be survivors of older stock that existed alongside more advanced Tyrannosaurs that would then have evolved a bit earlier than previously thought. This would mean that two huge clades of Tyrannosaur were around at the same time, though not the same place, as many of the basal forms I listed are known from Eurasia or the east coast of Laramidia. The one-two punch of Labacania anomala and Agione, therefore, might further indicate that advanced Eutyrannosaurians first evolved in southern Laramidia before migrating to the rest of North America and Eurasia. Many more fossil finds will be needed to fill in gaps, rearrange known data, and to narrow the confines of how these things were evolving over time and space. Speaking of time and space, what the hell was the world of Labocania Agione like? The Cerro del Pueblo formation is one of the most fossiliferous rock units in Mexico, producing most of the named dinosaurs. The rocks of Cerro del Pueblo indicate the region was subtropical to tropical in climate with the remains of palms, bananas, laurels, beaches, magnolias, istia, and lotuses found throughout. The recent reclassification of Coahuilaceratops as Mestrictian in age means that there are now no named Ceratopsian dinosaurs from the Cerro del Pueblo, though they were certainly there. Very fragmentary and indeterminate remains of centrosaurs and chasmosaurs are known, but they don't tell you much. Other than the horned dinosaurs, Labacania agione contended with nodosaurs, ankylosaurs, critosaurus, latirhinus, telatolophus, velophrons, thesellosaurids, as well as oviraptorosaurs, dromaeosaurs, ornithomimosaurs, the dinochirid patacenisaurus, and troodonts. Non-dinos include pterosaurs, the turtle Mexichiles, and a bunch of fish and mammal fossils, as well as animals found in other formations that have not yet been reported from this formation. You know, like bugs, arachnids, sharks, birds, lizards, frogs, salamanders, and much more. What will come out of Mexico next? Make sure you head over to the Darknix for his video about this amazing discovery. He helped me out on this project and deserves the attention. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.